So um, last week, for those of you uh, who were here and those of you who weren't, um, we looked at Acts 14 and we went all the way from the start to, to verse uh, 20. And today we're going to pick up the end of that story and we're going to go from Acts 14, 21 um, all the way to chapter 15. It's only a small verse. Um, but it's got a lot in it and there's a lot of power to it. And it's a continuation of the journey. And all I keep saying is remember this. Acts covers a 30-year period. What you're seeing did not happen overnight. It didn't just miraculously happen to them. There was something that they went through before. There was something that they cultivated. And I love this idea uh, when Jen was talking about Jesus being the bread of life and loving that. She's not the first person who said that to me this morning. But here's the thing about Jesus being the bread of life. If you don't go to him, and the bread of life can have no impact in your life. You see, it's a covenant. It's a two-way thing. God's calling you, but you've got to go to Jesus. If you want to know more about that, read the story of the prodigal son. The father's looking out, but it was only when he sees the son returning does Jesus then respond by running to him, adorning him, and feeding him, and celebrating over him. That's what God wants to do to each one of us. But it takes something of us to turn all it takes is to turn and to go back to God, to start walking, and he runs to us. Isn't that wonderful? Let's read this verse uh, together. So it should be Acts 14, uh, 21, all the way to, to 15. So it'll be up on the screen. Brilliant. They preached the gospel in that city, and if you remember, that city was Derby where they headed to, and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they say. Paul and Barnabas anointed, appointed sorry, elders and for, e and, uh, sorry, for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Presida, they came into Pamphylia, and, there, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Ataliah. And from Ataliah, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Amen. So if you remember from last week, they've been driven out of the city they were in, and they decided to go back into the city for a while and then head up, head off to Derby and preach the gospel. And um, within this verse, we find the second pillar of the kingdom of God, the second pillar of his church. So if you think about it, last week was all about evangelism. They were going from place to place to place, carrying Christ's message. And the immense importance of how we react to Christ and his kingdom, being part of his work, his mission, and his kingdom. Remember, it's always about Christ and Christ alone, and he is always at work. He's always seeking to do things, and he wants us to partner with him, but it's how we respond to him. And most importantly of all, how we respond to him when nobody else is around, in those quiet places, the places where we take off our armor, where we reveal the scars, the hurt, and the brokenness. That is where we do our business with God, where he strengthens us and where he prepares us for his work. That is why you see suddenly is outside of that. That is why you see him suddenly reacting and responding to you outside of that. It's because of the work that's been put in before that, that nobody else sees. You see, there is a great cost to having a depth in Christ. And this passage is all about Paul and Barnabas going back. And they've done the broad call. They've said, hey, who wants to know about this mission of grace that is in Christ? And now they're going, but if you want to really follow him, you've got to have deep roots. And deep roots take time. Deep roots are hard to pull out. Deep roots last. Deep roots can last through the harshest of winters. But they have to be cultivated first. See, if we want depth, we must be willing to go deep and we must be willing to sacrifice. I read this, I read this somewhere the other week. It said, there is no danger like that of losing your part in Christ. No advantage like that of keeping your hold of him. See, no matter what, Christ is always with you. He's always the way. 
And so as we set the scene for, for, this, for this verse that we're going to be looking at, what they're doing is simply following and obeying the Great Commission. If you remember the Great Commission, it says this, Then Jesus came to them and said this, and this you'll find this in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And this is Jesus speaking to the disciples for anything else has happened. He's been raised and he's met with them and he says this to them. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Read that promise every single day, I advise you. I am with you to the very end of the age. His first command in all of that, after telling them all authority on heaven and earth is his, he says, go. It's not a passive thing, it is an active thing. And when we, as a church being Wesleyan and Arminian in, in theology, we know that Wesley preached these means of grace, these things about you're not seeing anything going on, but you're just going to do stuff. You're just going to take this message of grace, maybe by praying for your neighbours, by being helpful, by getting involved in other things, but you're going to go. Go should be one of the things that defines the church, going and doing. We've seen many times in the Bible in the past, when, when God wasn't giving a specific word, the disciples still answered the general call to go and take his message of grace. So the first thing we do is go, and it's the first pillar of the church. It's the first thing that we push straight down into the ground to put our foundations on and build up, is go. But then the second pillar, you hear him straight after go. What does he tell us to go and do? Go and make disciples. It's funny that he doesn't say, go and preach the gospel. Go and tell people about Jesus. No, he wants something far more than that. He wants disciples. He wants people who are committed to Jesus. He wants people who are prepared to root their lives in the kingdom of God. He wants people who are prepared to sacrifice and give their all for Jesus. It's not enough to preach the gospel, the Great Commission tells us. It's not enough just to say, Jesus is the way. No, we have to help and develop people to become disciples. And we want to see disciples making disciples because you can't stop that wave. And that is the second great pillar of the church. But as you notice, that pillar is given far more attention in God's great commission than the go. The go is the obvious part. The go is the just go. The second part is now you're going to have to dig in. Me and, me and Liz have recently had our garden uh, overhauled and we've been planting new plants. I'm not a gardener by any stretch of the imagination, but I do get heavily invested in plants. And I used to have an apple tree that we left in a different house and I, I grieved. And me and these ants had a battle of who was going to win and I had all sorts of grease around the base and ant powder and I won, by the way. And, but if you think about it, you think about planting a new plant of any sort. The planting part is the quickest and easiest part. Yes, the, you know, you have to dig, out, dig up some soil, you have to make a hole for it, you have to put it in. There's an active cost to you to go out and get the plant, take it back to your garden and put it in. But once you put it in the ground, then starts the hard work of allowing it to take root, to take soil, to water it, to watch over it, to prune it, to keep it, to allow it to grow. My mom is very green-fingered, and one day I came home and she cut off all the heads of her roses. It was a massacre. There was just like these green stalks just sticking up out of nowhere. I thought mom and dad have had a time of it, I tell you. I thought, wow, is, mom, is that a metaphor for what mom wants to do to dad is what I was seeing. But she said to me, if I don't cut these off, not talking about dad now, the flowers, if I don't cut the heads off, they will not grow back the next year. There is an effort and a cost in us and from us in developing disciples. It is a lot easier. I know there's a hardship to going out and there is a cost. I'm not overlooking that to telling the gospel. There is a cost to that, absolutely. But we have to give a lot of ourselves if we're going to walk a journey with somebody and say, I'm going to do all I can to make you a disciple. We cannot know how they're going to respond to it. We do this all in love and grace. We meet people where they're at. But the Great Commission and this verse here says that it is not enough to preach the gospel. It is not enough. A story from when I, when I was in, me and Lids, we used to um, live over in uh, South Africa and we went to Zambia. And um, we, were, we were commissioned, if you like, to go and preach the gospel to these villages around Zambia. And we went with a team that was already out there. 
And the first thing that happened shocked me to my core. I went, um, can I tell you about Jesus? And they went, oh, no, no, sorry. We've already heard about him a few times. And they walked off. And this really baffled me. And I asked the guy, and he said, yeah, the problem is we get teams, and the way he put it was, we get teams of white Western Europeans coming over to preach the gospel, and they preach it, and then they leave. And if you do that long enough, people become deaf and numb to it. Because it's the same thing. Jesus loves you, and then you walk off and leave. What they were doing, what this team that lived there were doing, was that they were making disciples. And what these disciples then were doing were making disciples of their own. The disciples that they made there decided to find out where the closest village was, where the gospel hadn't been preached, and go to that village and make disciples. Because that's what they'd been trained to do. Not just tell somebody about the gospel, but make disciples. Live with them. Journey with them. Go through the highs and lows with them. But make disciples. Because it is disciples who change the world. And we pick up this verse in verse 21. And once again, we see the power that follows an obedient heart responding well to Christ. We see that they had preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. I cannot tell you this more and more and more and more is that if you cultivate a relationship with God, you will see a fruit of the work of God in your life. You see, what this doesn't tell me is how they preach the gospel or where they preach the gospel or what method they use to preach the gospel. What this simply tells me is they went on from one city to another. They'd been kicked out one they went to another and they preached the gospel and God responded to their hearts of obedience and what I want to pick up here is affirmation of preaching the gospel comes in two very different forms the first one is seeing many people come come to see the gospel but don't let that be a pressure on your life because just moments earlier they'd been kicked out of another city for preaching the gospel see affirmation and persecution are both markers of preaching the gospel. You see both in the Bible and both go hand in hand. And we need each other as we walk a journey with each other to know that actually through the good times, we celebrate one another, but we keep each other grounded. It's about Christ. And through the hard times, we keep cheering each other on and going, okay, where are we going to go next? What are we going to do next? And I believe if we do that, we will see large numbers of disciples. And notice that word there again disciples, won a large number of disciples. However they were preaching the gospel, whatever they were doing was do, being done in such a way that there was a depth to it. That they were cultivating longevity, not just short-term numbers. They wanted something more. You know, those, those strength that comes in Christ, it is cultivated in the quiet times with God. But let me tell you this, it's refined in obedience with God. You will cultivate it on your own when you're sitting with Christ. But you'll refine it as you step out and walk with him. And note this, that Paul and Barnabas always did this together. And just one of my encouragements today is, do you have a companion? Do you have a a soul mate? Do you have a spirit walker? Do you have somebody who you do mission and life with? Cultivate that relationship. Do it together. Don't do it on your own. And remember, remember always that no small act will go unnoticed by God. And that they went to this other city and they then saw a great number of people won for Christ. And then we get to verse 22, and I don't, I, don't, I don't want you to miss this. See, once the evangelism was over, once they got to where they wanted to go to, what did they do? They didn't just head home. They then journeyed back through all the places they'd been. Can you imagine? Just think about a place where it hasn't gone well for you, like badly well. Like it, It's just not worked for you. Maybe you had to leave under a cloud. Maybe it was hurtful. Maybe it was painful. And then do you have to go back to that place to continue the work that you started? And this is what faced Paul and Barnabas. They went back because they knew that Christ's goal and mission was far more important than they were. You see that they cultivate such a relationship with Christ in their lives. They were like, right, we've gone as far as we feel we should do in preaching the gospel of the first pillar. Now we're going to go back through and we're now going to go and strengthen those who responded to the gospel in the first place. 
The two for Paul and Barnabas went hand in hand. It wasn't there was a second wave that was going to come along. It wasn't anything like that. It was, we have preached the gospel, and now it is our duty as takers of the message of grace to God to now help those who have received it to cultivate it. You know, let's not become so concerned with winning souls that we stop once they are won. We don't want shallow believers. We don't want shoots that shoot up quickly but have no root. We don't want things that are just picked up and thrown. We want to give every believer the chance and opportunity to have deep roots. You see, we want rooty shoots, which sounds like a weird 80s band, I admit it, right? But we want shoots to grow up and have deep roots in, in Christ. And as I was thinking about this, this, the last couple of weeks, me and Lids have been potty training our, our youngest daughter, Beatrix. And, and can you imagine if I just walked up to Beatrix and said to her, hey, listen, Beatrix, um, we in the potty is far better than the nappy. Honestly, you don't have to keep the nappy on. You've got a free bottom. You can strut your stuff. We can just throw it down the toilet. It's, it's immense, right? This is the way to go. And then, after I just told her, and then I showed her once, I went, so B, here's the potty. When you need a wee or a poo, I'm easy. You do it in there. And then walked off and left her to it. I'm not naive enough to think that there might be, there might, there's one child out there who's going to disprove this rule, who the parents went, you wee in there now, and the child went, yes, mummy, and, and did it fine. I, I get that, right? But for most of us, that's not how it works. For most of us, we tell them that, and then we find a puddle somewhere, or a patch somewhere, or they run to us, and it hasn't really worked, and we have to put time and effort into cultivating this idea of getting uh, children potty training, and we have to start by where they're at. We have to go at their pace. We have to journey along with them, because we want them, our ultimate goal is we want them to be potty trained. We don't want them to wear nappies, because we know it is better to be potty trained than not. And I know, I know that's true because none of you are sitting here now by choice wearing nappies. None of you are doing that because we know it's better without them. And you see, what we want is we want potty trained disciples. We want people who we have taken time and effort into. We have gone at their pace. We have been gracious towards them. And we have helped them develop into followers of Jesus that can have solid food and not just milk. And let's read what the disciples did. So when they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, they strengthened the disciples and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. So the first thing they did was they strengthened the disciples. They encouraged them to remain true to the faith. And then we see later on that then they created a structure for the church. All of these things, all of these things were to help deepen their faith, were to help them make Help them have something that lasted. You see, Paul and Barnabas are teaching the disciples to obey all that Christ had commanded them and that Christ is always with them. They're doing what they were told to do in the Great Commission. And you see, that's a message that we need today, just as much as it was needed then. The church needs encouraging today, just as it, much as it needed then. The church needs to remain true to the faith today, just as much as it did then. The church needs structure, just as, it, just as much as it did then. In Hebrews 10, the writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God, with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to the cleansing us and cleansing us from guilt and a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold on swervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So this wasn't just a one-time message. The writers had to rewrite this message to the church. Don't give up meeting together. Be encouraged. Remember it's Christ only. Walk a journey with each other. Disciple one another. You all need somebody discipling you all need to be discipling somebody. You all need to be reminded from time to time that it is Christ and Christ alone 
that is important, that it's cultivating a relationship with him, that it's seeing him work out in your lives, it's doing it together. The church, time and time again in the New Testament, were told these messages because they're messages that we are quick to forget. Jen, when she started worship, she said that she needs to remind herself to praise and worship Jesus. We all need reminding, don't we? We have all gone through trying times and somebody comes up to us and gone, have you, have you tried spending time with God? And we kind of go, well, no, but if, I've been busy, you see. And it's just, and all we give, so we all need to be reminded. I have to remind myself daily. I honestly admit this to you daily that it's Christ first. That it's all about Christ. That it's in those quiet times. That it's communing heart to heart with Jesus. And at the end of the day, I remind myself just before I go to sleep that I am still deeply loved by Christ, that he forgives me for all the things that I've done during the day. And I remind myself of times during that day where Christ has done something miraculous and amazing in my life. Even if it's just a little thing that happens that makes me go, yeah, I'm deeply loved by Jesus. We all need reminding. We all need By meeting together, praying, discussing, communing together, we all need to be strengthened. We are not designed to be individuals. We are not, sorry, we're not designed to be individual on our own, by our own, by ourselves. We're designed to be in community. That's why we have house groups and bands and we meet together on Sundays. It's meant to be a time when we strengthen and encourage one another, telling stories about what God has done, praying for each other, allowing ourselves to be used by God for his grace to impact the lives of others, but also allowing God to impact our lives through other people. It takes a great amount of humility to say, I don't know everything, I can't do everything, and I need help. But it also takes a great amount of humility to say, Christ, work through me to impact the people in my church, the people in my community. Let me ask you this question. I was challenged by this question this week, and my answer wasn't a positive one, and that's why I was challenged by it. But do you prepare your hearts before you go to house group, or before you meet in your band, or before you come to church on a Sunday? Do you prepare your hearts in such a way that God can use you to reach out to other people? My answer was no, I don't. Like, I just expect God to just use me on a whim, like, just kind of go, oh, James, are you? And he does do that. Don't get me wrong. He, he, He does break through and do that. But how much more could he use the heart that was prepared, that spent time with him and said, God, if you need to use me at church for anything today, for anything this morning, I'm ready. And I'm so ready, I'm going to sit here and wait and just spend some time with you so you can prepare me for whatever it is you've called me to do. Like, just think about it. Do you prepare your hearts? And if you don't, give it a go. Like, God, when I'm meeting in band today, people are going to start telling me how they meet with you or what they do with you. Speak to me about that already. Let me know what you're saying. Oh, God, I'm about to share how my relationship is with you. How is my relationship with you, Jesus? Spend that time cultivating a relationship with God and then encourage. He encouraged the believers. And when Paul gets back to Antioch right at the end, it says he encouraged the believers again. And how does he encourage them? He tells stories. He supports. He reminds others of God's goodness. He does means of grace and pathways of peace. We all need that in our lives, don't we? We all need that in our lives, but we can't do that on our own. And then what do they say straight after this? So they've just encouraged. Just read it. They say, um, they're strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. And then this sentence, the writer seems to put straight afterwards. So he's just encouraged. He's just strengthened. Stay true to the faith. And then he says this, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Let me put that the other way around for you. To enter the kingdom of God, you must, you must go through many hardships. That's a promise. That's not optional. It's not opt-in. That is a promise that's being made. And it comes straight after they've been encouraged to meet together, to encourage one another, and to stray true to the faith. Why? Because the apostles know what's coming. They know they're going to need that when the poo hits the fan, when things get tough, when it gets really difficult. They're going to need what they've cultivated in quiet and in silence and with other believers because it's going to get hard. And why do they say it straight afterwards? That doesn't seem like the kind of sentence that would get believers stirred up to to encourage or even thinking, oh, this is going to happen. But that couldn't be further from the truth. See, if we want to be rooty shoots, then we need to dig in. You know, it couldn't be more wrong to tell the believers it's going to get hard. You see, it's true that we all meet with hardships. It is so appointed. 
all that will live a godly life in Christ should suffer persecution, tells us in 2 Timothy. And then in Matthew 16, he says this, all that will be Christ's disciples must take up their cross daily. We are guaranteed hardships. But how is this an encouraging message? See, whether a church leader, whether a lay delegate, whether just somebody who's part of the church, we are all subject to it. It's what believing in Christ is all about. It's what we signed up to. But, you know, here is the hope. Here is the reason they said it. Here's the encouragement. Here's why it's right in the middle of this passage. You see, it's true that we must go through many hardships, but we shall get through it. See, not only that, but waiting on the other side is a crown of glory and the kingdom of God. There's the hope. The hope is that in this life we're going to face many trials. But if we stay the course, if we dig in, if we do it together on the other side, there's a crown of glory waiting for us. There's a kingdom of God with gates open for us. And more than that, if that's not enough hope, let me give you some more. You see, Christ is both with us and waiting for us. Yes, Christ promised hardships, but he says, surely I am with you to the very end. Never leaves, never forsakes, always with. He's, with, he's there with us and he is waiting for for us when we get there. He's there journeying with us and ready to hug us when we get to the end. He is both the means of getting through, but the destination that we are heading for. You see, if we want to get to the crown, we've got to go through the cross. Because to get to the crown, we have to journey through the cross. Jesus was given a crown of glory when he went to the cross. He tells his disciples to pick up his cross. He says, you're going to do what I've done. You're go I'm not going to go anywhere that I'm not going to ask you to go. He leads us and we follow him. You see, we get to the crown by way of the cross. There is hope in persecution because persecution, this is why the disciples rejoice because they realized that they were being persecuted because Christ was being seen in them. They realized that these hardships were momentary. They realized that these hardships were drawing them closer to Christ, not further away. And they knew what was waiting for them. They knew they would make it through. They knew that Christ was with them. They knew that Christ was waiting for them. And they knew that they were heading towards the crown and the kingdom through the cross. And that is something to celebrate. Because when it's all over, when all is said and done, when I finally lay my head to rest eternally, I will be greeted by Jesus. And he'll have a crown of glory. And he's there just for me. And then lastly, this, this idea of godly structure. And all I want to say here is holy structure leads to freedom. And let me give you a very short analogy of what I mean here. I'm a real big rugby fan, right? The All Blacks are the world's greatest rugby team. In fact, for the last five or six years in a row, um, there's a, a governing body who tell us which is the greatest sports team overall, like across all sports. And they have loads of different metrics. And the All Blacks regularly come out on top of this. They've cultivated this winning culture. But what's interesting is that All Blacks seem to have this uh, way of, be, of playing free, of just doing stuff, of responding to stuff, of stuff just happening that other teams don't seem to be able to do. But when you read into the metrics of it, the All Blacks, the New Zealand national rugby team, are the most structured rugby team on the planet. In fact, they kick the ball away more than any other rugby team on the planet. They have a very, very set, defined leadership structure. And they, when they're, one leader's stepping out, they have a new one that's already been cultivated for the last couple of years to take over. In their captaincy of their team, they know which person is going to be the next captain after the next one's left. And by the time he gets the captaincy, he's been cultivated for about five or six years in the run-up to this. It's not a mistake that this happens. They have created a structure that allows the All Blacks to play with such freedom and dominate and dismantle all other teams. You see, a holy church structure leads to great freedom. You see, they appointed elders for each, um, it, it, it appointed elders in each church, and with prayer and fasting, fasting, committed them to the Lord. I would say this to both leaders and those in congregations who aren't leading. If you're a leader, you have a duty of God to lead with care, devotion, 
and grace. You have a duty to lead from a quiet place and a strength in Christ. It is not just something you're given that you should take for granted. It is a duty that you have and Christ and the other believers in the Bible talk very strictly and sternly about what it means to be a church believer, a church leader. We have a duty. And then the duty of those people who aren't leaders is to pray for our leaders, is to encourage our leaders, is to spur on our leaders. Do you pray for the leaders of Freedom Church? Or if you're here from a different church, do you pray for the leaders of those churches? Let me tell you, if you want to see God cultivate a healthy culture of freedom in your church, you both need godly leaders who are pressing into God, and you need others who are praying for those godly leaders, and you need both keeping each other accountable, because nobody is above accountability. Nobody. Not me, not David, not anybody. But rooty churches, churches deeply rooted in Christ, have godly leaders and a godly structure. We need to pray for our leaders. And hey, if you sense the call of leadership on your life, make it known. But let me tell you this now, you're going to step into a duty which requires great humility, great faith, and which will hold a mirror up to you. And God will seek to make you the best leader he can. And he will say to you, are you willing to respond to me? We need godly leaders. We need godly leaders. And we need godly people praying for godly leaders. So if you're, of a, lead, if you're a leader, you have a duty to be a godly leader, to be a good leader, to be a faithful leader, to cultivate our relationship with Christ. And all of us have a duty to pray for our leaders. Because I want godly leaders here at Freedom Church. I want godly leaders in other churches. I want godly leaders in every sphere of, of the United Kingdom. We want godly leaders, right? Let's pray for godly leaders. Let's pray for one another. And then lastly, as we're coming into the land, and this is part of my, my, probably my favorite part, on finishing this discipleship journey, however long it took, on feeling like they'd gotten to the point where they go, right, we can leave, we can move on, we can go home. What did they do? They did exactly what they told the other churches to do. They went back to their sending church, to their community. They encouraged them. And the, the verse that jumps out to me is, and how Jesus had opened a door of faith in the Gentiles. They went back and they told people about what Jesus had done. Not what they'd done, what Jesus had done. As though they were on a journey with Jesus, watching Jesus, and then went back and reported what Jesus had done. So they were encouraging the believers. They were spending time with other believers. So they were meeting together. They came under the church structure that they had set up in their sending church, and they became uh, just disciples within that church. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. They allowed themselves, after being on the battleground, after being on the mission field, to be rooted again by encouraging and being encouraged, by coming under a godly leadership, by spending time with other believers. And they cultivated the exact thing that they were encouraging others to do. You cannot encourage others to cultivate something you're not doing yourself. Only things that are authentic stick and work. And people can spot uh, inauthenticity, which isn't the right word, from a mile away. I can't tell you to be a disciple of Jesus unless I'm doing it myself, because you will spot it. I can't tell you to press into Jesus in prayer, because it's the best thing ever, if I'm not doing it myself, because I won't be able to, and you'll spot that. But just as we going out need to encourage people to be disciples and deeply rooted in Christ, so we also need to be deeply rooted in Christ. We all need a godly community where we can grow and develop roots so that we are ready on that day that God calls us. As we land and we're going to start to worship again, the question is, do you want to be a rooty shoot? Do you want to have deep roots developed over time in Christ? Do you want to know a depth of relationship in Christ that you've never known before? Do you want to feel God's hand on you? Do you want God to prepare you for the work that he has? Do you want to see these magnificent wonders and people coming to know Christ? Because it starts in the quiet place by yourself. And if you do nothing else for Christ but spend time in that quiet place with God, he will prepare you for his work and you will see his work done through you. So why don't we just stand? Why don't we all stand now? And why don't we make a declaration? Why don't we ask God to come into the depths of our hearts right now? And 
why don't we just, if you're able, just hold out your hands. Because we want to be a church, a freedom church that is deep and deeply rooted in Christ. And in this time of worship, we want God to challenge our hearts. Jesus, would you come and, and would you show us those places in our hearts that we're not letting you into? Those boundaries that are stopping us going deeper. Would you make us deeply rooted disciples in you who make deeply rooted disciples in you? quietness as Jenny is playing as she starts to worship why don't you just ask God for yourself what you want from him if you want him deeply rooted in your life ask him and then just wait and let your heart and his car communicate Jesus pour out your spirit here we ask this in the name of Jesus